Hi and welcome back to a new video. As promised yesterday, we will take a closer look today at the RTX 4090 Aorus Master. Yesterday we did a video about the Founders Edition, not so much about the card itself, more about the chip. Today I want to see Ada naked, I want to take off the cooler of this card, I want to do some overclocking, see how far we can push the chip, because just theoretically speaking, this card has so much more volume than this one. I just measured some like outside dimensions. This is about five centimeters longer, it's about two centimeters higher. So just the overall volume of this card right here is about 72% more than this one. And just in theory, if you have 72% more volume, you can utilize this space for more cooling fins, for example, for your heatsink. And this way, just in theory, maybe have better cooling performance. We have three fans instead of two. So that should be quite exciting, quite entertaining. On the Founders Edition, we already saw clocks close to three gigahertz, and that's why I want to see how far we can push the Aorus Master. It's just absolutely impressive how much mass, how much buffer mass this cooler has, because simply, if you plug this in and just keep it running in idle in Windows, it will be passive. And then if you start, let's say, the GPU-Z render test, which will cause a load of like 330 to 350 watt, it takes like a minute for the fans to start spinning. And as you can see, the Gigabyte card comes with these, what they call halo effect light. So one of the fan blades contains an LED. And with this LED, you can generate custom effects for your fan. It's also quite interesting that it looks quite a bit different in reality than it looks on the camera, but that is just related to the shutter speed of the camera. And yeah, nothing we can do about that, but at least Theoretically speaking, you could customize this and generate custom effects. There's also an LCD on the side and also again, theoretically, you could customize this and display system information. At the point shooting this video, the software for this seems not to be ready. At least we cannot change it for now. And I'm waiting for Gigabyte to get a software update for this. So it could be that this will not make it in today's video, simply because we get the card before launch and the software is not quite ready yet. We performed like um, five, six, seven minute heat up phase to get some heat into the card to check what kind of clocks we can see with the Aorus Master. And I can tell you, this is quite impressive. This is like 60 megahertz more than what we saw with the Founders Edition, closing in on 2800 megahertz stock. While the GPU temperature, as you can see, is not even hitting 60 degrees Celsius on a card that consumes above 400 watt. Cooling wise, this is just, it's just completely insane. You have to consider that this is an air-cooled card and those are temperatures you would typically not see on air-cooled cards. It's not quite as good as water cooling, but still, considering the power consumption, this is quite nice. But also the power consumption is only hitting about 90% TDP and we can see PerfCap Reason is VREL, which means that we are not actually power limited, but we are voltage limited. This means for increasing the clock further, we would have to increase the GPU voltage further than 1.05 volt. For overclocking, we can use our engine, which is essentially the same as like the MSI afterburner or like the GPU tweak or whatever, it's all based on the same. And we could theoretically increase the power target by 33%, which allows the car to consume up to 600 watt. But this shouldn't do anything, considering that our perfect reason is not the power limit. And you can see it didn't change anything. Power consumption is still the same. Clock is also still the same. So the only thing we can basically do is unlock the GPU voltage, set this to plus 100, which, and I can already tell you, this is not going to be enough because we are still in VREL and we are only at about 107% TDP, but it's clocking to 2850 megahertz. This is almost three gigahertz without even touching the clock of the card. That is already so impressive. Without overclocking so completely stock in times by extreme GT1, we will have about 123.5 FPS, which is pretty much identical to the Founders Edition. If we now drag up the voltage slider as shown before, we increase this by three FPS to 126. I slightly increased the clock by plus 170 megahertz in the GPU boost. And it seems like I already hit the limit because you can see some artifacts appearing in the background and that's by just above 3000 megahertz. So it's pretty much identical to the Founders Edition, even though the temperature is a tiny bit lower, but this seems to be 
pretty much the same. We're closing in on 500 watt power consumption on the card, but the perf cap reason is still VREL. So it means that technically to get higher clocks, we would need more voltage, which is locked, which is not possible. And that's quite unfortunate. With slightly above 3000 megahertz on the core and slightly above 1400 megahertz on the memory, we were able to get a score of 131.3 FPS in times by Extreme GT1. That's an increase of about 8 FPS, also translating in about 6% performance increase. But you also have to keep in mind that constantly during this benchmark, the card was pulling about 520 watt under load. But that's still far away from the actual power limit even without performing a power limit mod on the card. Like previously, let's say with GTX 1000 series or RTX 20 series, you always straight had to do like a power limit mod. That's not necessary because we're kind of voltage limited on the card. And to figure out if it's possible to increase the voltage and if, how easy, we will first have to disassemble the card. The first step would be to take off the back plate. This is still quite warm. Should be connected to the PCB with some thermal pads at least. And we can also find a switch right here where you can select OC or silent profile. But basically it's just raising the GPU temperature limit. And in theory you should see temperatures of about 65 to 66 degrees Celsius with the silent profile. And the fans should spin a little lower. But like there is no difference in power limit or voltages or whatsoever. That's why we just tested everything with the OC profile. All right, it turned out that we're not taking off the backplate. We're taking off backplate and card from the cooler. And first thing I straight noticed, apart from that the GPU is drowned in thermal paste, which is not bad because more typically helps more. At least in the center, there's almost no thermal paste. So the minimum layer thickness is quite nice, but you can spot two different colors of thermal paste which kind of indicates that this card has been disassembled before. Which I'm not quite sure why Gigabyte did this. Maybe this was like a test unit or something they sent to me. But this also means that this could maybe not reflect retail performance. Usually the performance is better if it has not been disassembled in between. And even if you disassemble it, Maybe just next time clean off the thermal paste completely and do a proper application that looks fresh and don't mix two pastes. I originally wanted to take off all the thermal pads to be able to inspect all the like faces and stuff, but the pads used are very brittle. So if you take these off, they will just fall apart. This means if you ever get one of these cards and you take it apart, you will have to get replacement thermal pads. And just so you know, like the one on the inductor, for example, those are one millimeter thick thermal pads. This pad, which came from the bottom memory chip, seems to be a little bit thicker. So that is a two millimeter thermal pad. It's also quite unusual that the part that requires a bit more cooling or can benefit from more cooling uses thicker pads. This also means that this probably has some potential for better thermals if you replace them with higher grade pads. But then again, at this moment, I'm not even sure if this would help you on a 4090 because the thermals overall look great. But that could be something for a future video, at least if you want to see it. Now, after removing the backplate, you can see that only some capacitors are making direct contact with the backplate. And considering how hot this backplate gets, that's quite nice. How much energy is transferred through the capacitors to the backplate. I find it quite entertaining how tiny the card is compared to just the cooler and also to before taking the cooler off. Has some benefits to it though if you want to plan to move to water cooling, to custom water cooling, then it will take up a lot less space inside your system and just theoretically a custom water cooling loop vendor could make smaller and also cheaper coolers. I'm not quite sure if that's going to be the case but at least it's a pretty tiny card. There is one interesting find which we had on the top left corner of the card. Well, in this case for you, the bottom right. But you can see, if we just tilt this a little bit and you can see those reflections, this area right here, this is an NVLink connector or it was originally meant to be an NVLink connector, but seems like Nvidia maybe decided last minute that it's not going to support NVLink because it's definitely there. The traces are there, the contacts are there. They are just hidden underneath the solder mask. That is quite interesting. 
Also a quick look at the cooler itself, simply because this is such a huge thing with 13 heat pipes hidden underneath the fins. And we have this huge vapor chamber, which is distributing all the heat that's coming from the chip and also from the memory chips, for example. That could also be one reason why they use two millimeter pads on the memory, because you can see there are some other pads around here, which are thinner. That means that the memory is probably surrounded by other components that are a bit higher than the memory. And that means that you will have to make contact to the higher components first. They are using one millimeter pads and then the memory simply is lower and then makes contact at last with thicker pads. Left and right to it, we have these areas that are for cooling the VRMs. But yeah, that is just a huge, a huge vapor chamber with a lot of heat pipes. And with this, we already reached the end of this quick video. I simply wanted to find out if a little bit better cooling, this is what we get with Aorus Master compared to the Founders Edition, we can generate higher clocks. But that seems to be not the case. We are still just purely voltage limited from what I can see. We are definitely not power limited. And also if we run the fans at 100% fan speed, which lowers the thermals by another like seven to eight degrees Celsius, you cannot clock higher. And what you could see in GPU-C just indicates that we need more voltage, which is not that easy to get because, thank you NVIDIA for limiting everything, we cannot get more voltage just out of the box, like over BIOS, over software, because everything is limited. We cannot easily do it. But I will definitely reach out to Elmore. Maybe he, ha he has an idea. Maybe he can help us to hook up the EVC to this card, get it working, and maybe this way we can get a bit more voltage and then maybe clock the card a little bit higher. If there's anything I can find out, I will definitely let you know. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.